Fraser first, and then I'll come forward to the second question. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Christopher Wilkinson, I, I'm a member of the Internet Society in chapter in Bologna and in a previous incarnation was one of Mark Bohannon's uh, transatlantic sparring partners. Um, I just want to refer briefly to a potential obstacle to open innovation, particularly if you link it, as Mark has just done now, to, to big data. Uh, we are currently dealing with a proposal from European telecommunications operators that sending parties should pay. Uh, their current target is explicitly Google, uh, and they are resisting uh, the present arrangement where basically the sending party, irrespective of the volume, does not pay. Now, your, your statements this morning have been fascinating, but none of you have referred to the size of the pipes. Uh, particularly, and I address Dr. Kaiserwerte, uh, because the, the telecommunications re regulations apply over a decade, and your scenarios were about a decade. Uh, how would sending party pays affect the practical use of big data who would pay? Thank you. Ah, so, Matthias, over to you. Yeah, I'm, afraid I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not a policy person, but I think uh, you, you, uh, um, you, you uh, really mentioned an important point that, uh, in fact, uh, a lot of, uh, if you take into account that innovation that will take place, uh, I have no doubt in the, in the next uh, 10 years, um, we can, through public policy and regulation, I think we can in Europe, if we get back to your, uh, your statement, we could in Europe uh, advantage things possibly. I mean, uh, when you think back of uh, GSM, that was uh, one prime example in, in some way. Technically it was possible, we standardized it in Europe, uh, or leading, really, the Americans sort of said, let the market fight it out. In Europe, uh, we sort of said, it's going to be GSM, and that uh, um, really we had the industry then around it. Um, and, uh, and I think that's something that needs to be done in, in, in lockstep to some extent, and, and people need to become cognizant of the fact that uh, we have these developments going on and, and capabilities, and then from a policy point of view, you can probably make, make suitable changes. Okay, now there was another question. The gentleman, in, uh, I'm afraid the gentleman in the check shirt must... Uh... They're in cahoots. Just, uh, okay, sure. Just to say, if that's what you think, you'd better say so real loud soon, because it's going ahead in the <laughs> ITU and you'll be screwed. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually a good point. <laughs> uh, you, you have a question? This gentleman had a brief question. Thank you. Uh, uh, so... Um, my name is Nicolas Petit. I have three comments and, and, co well, and questions. Well, well, I'm afraid we're, we're quite short in time, so if you okay. have one really okay. good so comment instead. So one, one comment as far as how to lead uh, as a teacher. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I think that we have to go back down to change the model of education that we do. From the start, from the age of three, uh, students and, uh, and pupils are taught not to share. They are taught that sharing, copying, is bad. If we want that as soon as they are grown up, they change their mind, we would better change their mind right from the age of three and not wait for when they are 18. I think that the education is really hard to change. So the roots of education. And, and that is difficult. And what I also see, and that's a very big trouble for me, is that I heard companies that try to tap in the collective uh, ideas and try to privatize them, at least some of them. As much as the bank tried to privatize the benefit and uh, share the loss and the costs, as we've seen. So this is not fair. I think the, the, the thing that is fair in its going and playing in a fair field where everything is shared, the benefits as well as the costs. 
In the pharmaceutical industry, for example, everything, every, most companies ask for public sector to invest. But the, what is, it, it is shown is that through reduction of taxes and so on, in general, the investment in R&D is roughly 80% public money. And the, the benefit is not 80% back to the public money. So my question would be, what would you propose for the ICT world to, to go in such a direction, and would it be possible? Uh, does anyone want to take that, or do we need... Yes, it, it's quite a, quite a long comment. I'm not sure exactly where the question is. Uh, I understand that you're concerned about public-private partnership investment and the long-term return to society, but I think the numbers in places like the U.S. tend to show that the, the utilization by the private sector of... Uh, IP released by the government comes back in economic terms as well. It, it depends on your window of investment here. So, you know, in a few years, yes, the private enterprise gets a lot, but in the long term, private enterprise, their innovations and their building on innovations comes back. Patents expire, copyright expires. So I guess it depends on the window. I don't know, does anyone have a specific comment on that? Very briefly, though. Very brief comment, and, and I'm actually thinking about Andy Updegrove's um, comments on the first panel about the way the US government has thought about its R&D and IP. I, I think Andy touched on a very important point, and what Andy was describing was, in fact, a 40-year history of doing tech transfer across a variety of sectors. The old model of tech transfer is that a national laboratory would build a technology, invite people in, try to license it, you know, the old model of I'm going to own it, keep it private, I'm going to manage it. Um, about 20 years ago, they were finding that there was not much success. I mean, you could find a few examples that, that could do it, but it really wasn't engaging and, and being strategic in how it's thinking. Um, and so around the time I came into the U.S. government, I'm not responsible, but there was, I think, a, a con building consensus that we had to rethink that. And I, I, I think it's an old term, but the term public-private partnership developed, which was, you know, innovation is a body contact sport. I mean, one does not just sit in a corner and, you know, think big thoughts. Um, that model dissipated many, many years ago. You know, it's about engaging. And so the move was to get the national labs to do more things directly with people in different sectors, different disciplines, to come together to figure out how to solve problems. What evolved out of that were different legal arrangements. For example, you did not depend on a contract or a financial assistance arrangement. You had what was called a cooperative research and development agreement, which by its very terms describes the kind of work. There was no money involved. Actually, uh, the private sector could pay for the services, but the government wasn't giving money out. What it was doing was being a convener, allowing its own ex expertise to be distributed in an effective way, but doing so in the context of people who were also doing work outside. And, and I think that's a model to think about with open source. I mean, as we work with US agencies who are doing software development and trying to open source, bringing that mentality of the collaboration which is not the way we've always thought about it in the open source community, but you've got to work with government minds and the legal frameworks that they exist in. How do we do that? And I think it's a ripe discussion to have across any economy and any governmental system. How do we encourage, consistent with good values, good ethics, and everything else, that kind of collaboration, which is going to benefit everyone? Thank you, Mark. And uh, Keith has a very brief note, and then we're going to wrap up. One uh, final comment. I think what we're also looking at here is humility which is a critical component that we socialize into our cultures. The open source community's hallmark is humility. You think about the first comment that, the first post that uh, Linus Torvalds made 21 years ago, inviting others to come in and not having high expectations about what he was putting out there to share and for people to add to. And his, his post was, was very much, you know, characterized by the notion that who knows where this will go, I'm sure lots of smart people are going to come in and contribute things and make it better, and that's all I can hope for. And he kind of lit a fuse, and that fuse is burning brightly now, and it's changing the way we create value in the economy, but largely because even to this day, there's humility in the community. People know that they have that childlike 
that childlike sense of, of learning from someone else. And if you don't learn from someone else, you're not going to be able to participate. And humility is the key characteristic that we maintain throughout our lives as a community. We, may, we manifest it to be able to actually learn from one another. We don't see that in large corporations sometimes. We stop seeing that because we, cl we shut down after 25 years of age to really new learning and new novelty. And I think that's what has to change. And that's a fundamental. To, to any successful organization is to have that and that, that yearning to, to, to grow and learn. Excellent, thank you, Keith. So in essence then, when we ask what does open innovation mean for the European ICT market, it means change, a lot of change. And if we embrace that change, we can have a great uh, result. Now, we're going to move to a coffee break, I believe, in the next panel, how can Europe compete? Uh, I just want to end on a thought from Thomas, actually, that it's interesting to note that funding for open innovation in Europe came from the US in the case of MySQL. Maybe that's something we need to think more deeply about when we talk about what does this mean for us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. about uh, networking and informal discussions, so we don't want to cut too much into the, to the coffee break. So are we going to allow 25 minutes for the coffee break? Uh, and we'll be back here um, at 11.